I, I want to just share something that's been going around and around in my heart, and hopefully I can get it out. And uh, let's turn in our Bibles to First Peter chapter two, verse nine. So is this about us? You know, we, we don't know who we are until we know whose we are. We belong to God. And he says this about us. You are a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous night. You are a chosen generation. God has chosen us. Don't think that you're here by accident. God has chosen you. You are a royal priesthood. We're a priesthood of God. And uh, we're a holy nation. Holy means set apart. It means separate. We're supposed to be set apart to God. A holy people. I want to have a look at where this comes from in the book of Exodus. It's actually not just in the New Testament. It comes out of the book of Exodus. For those of you that know the story and, and are very familiar with it, just bear with me. I want to bring some and glean some truths out of this of how it applies to us. In Exodus chapter 19, it's the second book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus. Verses 3 to 6. The Moses went up to God and the Lord called him to the mountain. Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob, tell the children of Israel, You've seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And if I can just set up the background to this. They had been three months in the wilderness. Moses had led these people, these, these Israelites, out of Egypt. He'd gone before Pharaoh and challenged Pharaoh and said, Pharaoh, let my people go to worship God. He only wanted three days. That was all he originally asked for. Bring, bring my people, let my people go. We want to worship God. Let them go three days and we'll worship God. Pharaoh said no. And so they had this challenge between Moses and the leader of the day. And sometimes I wonder, you know, if we need a Moses to challenge the leaders of the day. But God has called us a, a holy nation. And uh, they had this challenge, and so there were ten plagues that came against Egypt. And the final plague was the death of all the firstborn. And so the Egyptians actually drove these people out. They crossed the Red Sea miraculously. Moses held out his staff. The waters parted. It said an east wind blew all night. The waters parted. And they crossed as if it was on dry land. A great miracle. And so Moses was leading these people. He'd led them into the wilderness. They had nothing to eat. So Moses went before God and this thing called manna came down from heaven. It tasted like uh, honey wafers, this sweet thing. They had to go and pick it up every day. They had this miraculous thing time and time and time again under Moses' leadership. They followed the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. They followed the presence of God under Moses' leadership. But here they are three months in and God says to Moses, I am going to come down on the mountain and speak to you. You're going to speak to me and I will answer so that the people will follow. I think this is amazing. They had, Moses had led these people through all this stuff and yet God still wanted to confirm his leadership. He still wanted to say, Moses, you're the man and I want people to recognize it. And so this is what happened. He said, I want you to consecrate the people. Tell them to behave themselves. Husbands, don't go to your wives. No funny business. Separate yourself. And I am going to come down on the mountain and you will speak to me and I will answer. And so this is what happened in this whole chapter. I'm going to come to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. Let them wash their clothes. Let them be ready for the third day. On the third day, I will come down. So they sanctify themselves. 
They waited three days, and on the third day, verse 16, in the morning, God came down. It's, I tell you what, it's a wonderful thing when you have an encounter with the living God, when God comes down, when you come into his presence. Hebrews tells us that we have boldness to come before the throne of God, to come into his presence. God came down to these people on the third day. There were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. I don't know if you've been in the presence of God and, and trembled at the power of his presence. I know I've, I've had some interesting experiences with God. I was telling somebody the other day when, when we had a move of God back in the 90s, I was drunk for a year, <laughs> drunk in the spirit. And we have different responses to the presence of God. God came down so powerfully. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. And Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people lest they break through to gaze at the Lord and many of them perish. Moses said, no, no, we've already told them they'll keep outside. But God said, no, go down and warn them lest they break through. And there was this whole thing that came upon the people of Israel that they feared God greatly. We need the fear of God again, friends. A nation needs the fear of God. And this is what they said. Let me look at this verse. Verses 10 to 15, the people were consecrated. Verse 16, God came down. In Exodus chapter 20, God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. And we have the law was given. It's very interesting that, that God said, I want you to follow Moses. So I'm going to confirm who you are with my authority. And then God gave the Ten Commandments. You know, God wants us to live in righteousness. The Bible says in Galatians that, that the law is the schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. The whole law is not just about a bunch of do's and don'ts, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a moral and an ethical fibre. It's, it's a moral boundary. It shows us how to walk in righteousness. That's what the law is about. And the law that we have in our day is founded upon these things, founded upon the Ten Commandments. It's founded upon the truths in the Word of God. That's where the original law came from. It comes from God, from who He is, from His character and His nature. And He gives us these boundaries of do's and don'ts. It's, it's about morality and ethics. It's not just about a bunch of laws. The letter of the law kills, but the Spirit gives life. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. But I, I just want to point out some things here that, that God had confirmed Moses so that then he could bring the law. And he could bring these truths and this, this moral character and, and how we're supposed to live rightly before God. Hello? That's what God wants us to do. That's what the law is about. It's the schoolmaster that leads us into relationship with Christ. But out of the relationship of Christ, when the law is written on our hearts, we have this conscience of, of what is right and wrong. Rather than have to remember all the stuff. Anybody ever had to visit a lawyer? Hello? And the lawyers know the law, and they've got all this stuff. You read some of this stuff. You read the rest of the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy. It's all the civil and ceremonial law. It's how we treat God. It's how we treat one another. And isn't that still our challenge today? It's our attitude towards God and how we treat one another. And aren't they the concerns that we have when we listen to the news and we see the reports of what's happening in the nation and in the nations and in the state and our governors? It's how we treat God. It's how we treat one another. They're the, they're the moral fibres. And we have the letter of the law that is supposed to dictate some of this to us. And so we get concerned when weird laws are passed. We get concerned when some of these laws change the way we relate to one another because they don't line up with the word of God. We're supposed to be a holy 
nation, a royal priesthood. Are you hearing me today? So th this is so important that we understand where the Word of God comes from. It comes from God. It's absolute truth that comes from God. It's His values written here. So we want to line up with Him and walk with Him. So that we have the Ten Commandments through Exodus chapter 20. But listen to this in verse 19. They said to Moses, You speak with us, Moses, and we will hear. But don't let God speak to us lest we die. Because they'd been in that place where the fear of God came. They were on the mountain with the incredible presence of God. And they said, Moses, you're the man. You speak to us. You speak to God, but don't let God speak to us. The most tragic verses in the Bible, I think. Don't let God speak to us. Whereas today, we're saying, God, speak to us. God, speak. Let us hear your voice. God, speak. Speak to our nation. Let our nation hear your voice. God, speak. Speak to our leaders. Let our leaders hear your voice. We need the voice of God to come. We need God to speak. We need God to, to reaffirm, to realign, to bring who he is and to bring an awareness and awakening. It's one of the things we're praying for in this prayer for revival, this prayer for a great awakening, this prayer for God to reveal himself afresh to our nation, to our people. To, but God, would you would come and people would see you for who you are. Speak, God. Speak. Speak afresh. Reveal yourself afresh. My God, that you would come in power and life and, and your thick cloud would come down afresh upon our nation and that you would come and bring all that who you are would be revealed and there would be no longer any question mark about how to, which way we should live, what we should do, what's right and wrong. Am I a man or a woman? My goodness. God did not create Adam and Steve. <laughs> I better stay on track, I'll get off track. <laughs> We're called to be a royal priesthood. A priest. What is a priest? A priest is one who stands before God and ministers to God and honors God and hears from God on behalf of the people, for the people. We come every Sunday to listen to somebody preach the word, trusting that that person has spent time with God to hear what God is saying. The priest stands before God and hears. We are all called as a royal priesthood. We all should stand in the presence of God and hear what God is saying. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. He wants us to hear his voice. Roman was talking about different ways to do it with journaling. There are many, many ways that we can hear God's voice. But as Christians, we all have that relationship with him where we can hear his voice and know what God is saying. Hello? We are a royal priesthood where we hear the voice of God. Moving along a few hundred years, in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 8, Samuel's sons did not walk in Samuel's ways, and they turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. Very, very sad that this great man of God couldn't raise his sons to follow in righteousness. And all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel and said to him, Look, you're old. Your sons don't walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, listen to what they say, for they have not rejected you, but they've rejected me, that I should not reign over them. They were supposed to be a holy nation, separated to God. But they're saying, God, Make us like all the other nations. Make us like them. We don't want to be holy. We don't want to be set apart anymore. It's, there's something about holiness, friends. Without holiness, no one will see God. 
But God is set apart. He's holy. That's why they had trouble originally when they went up and the, the presence of God came down upon the mountain in a thick cloud and they, they, they were afraid because there's something when the presence of God comes that brings deep conviction and we become aware of the things that are not holy. And isn't that why people often don't want God? Because they are aware of the things in their life that are not holy. They become conscious of sin. They become conscious of that which is not right before God. And people that are so deeply ingrained in sin saying, oh, I'm never going to get involved with church because my sin won't like it and I want to keep my sin. And, you know, thank God that, that God is full of grace and full of mercy and he's full of life and he's, he's come to bring us into a place of life and set us free from that stuff, set us free from sin. Friends, if sin was unpleasant, nobody would do it. Hello? Isn't that the nature of it? There's something in our nature that gets drawn to sin, but yet when we're born again, we despise it, we don't like it, we want to turn away from it, we repent. Hello? We need God to help us out of this thing. It, we can't do it on our own ability. By grace we are saved, and not, not of ourselves, but yet by faith in what Christ has done for us. We need him. We need God. Our nation needs God. Our nation needs us to stand and pray for it because they're walking away from God. But if we don't stand and pray and bring the presence of God to come and convict them and bring his power around about them, how are they ever going to know? How are they ever going to know the truth unless there's somebody that speaks truth? Well, are you hearing me? We're a royal priesthood to bring the presence of God, to pray the presence of God, to bring the answers of God to our nation. We're not here by, by chance. We are a chosen generation. God has chosen us to have a voice. God has chosen us to stand up and speak up. God has chosen us. This is our, our great opportunity, friends. It might seem like great problems, but it's our great opportunity to stand up and speak up, speak truth, speak life, bring the presence of God and allow God to touch people's lives and gather them into his presence. Hello. This is... Give us a king that we may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. That's what they ask for in verse... 19 and 20. Give us a king that they might judge us. Now they'd had the law given to them. They'd had the Ten Commandments. They'd had all the civil and ceremonial law and all the laws of how to treat one another, what to do if your animal falls into a pit and what happens if you know somebody takes your stuff and all the laws of the Ten Commandments and all that sort of thing. They'd had the law. But yet they said, give us a king that they might judge us. Any of you been to court and stood before a judge? Oh, you don't have to put your hand up. <laughs> judge Judy presiding? No. <laughs> and they were asking for somebody to judge them. But we have, we have Christ who we stand before, who is our mediator who stands before the judge for us. We have a saviour who stands before the judge for us. For God is the judge of all, the living and the dead. But yet on this earth, when you go to court, it's an unpleasant thing. My wife works with legal aid and she tells me some very interesting stories. Sometimes I go, it's too much, don't tell me anymore, please. I, I can't handle the trauma and the stress that these people go through, devastated lives. And, and the courts are ruling this way and that way. And these people are asking for a king to judge them. What does that mean to us in this day? How, how, do, how are we supposed to walk in judgment? The Bible tells us in uh, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15, it talks about us judging. Mark, uh, I think it's Matthew 7, says, Don't judge unless you be judged. But 1 Corinthians 2 tells us how we should judge. Oh, 
find it, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 15. He who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. If we're going to be spiritual, we've got to judge all things. Now, in the context of this, this is not about passing sentence. This is not about saying, okay, you're guilty, go and do six Hail Marys. No, this is about discernment. It says, we've, verse 12, we've received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive these things, for their foolishness to him, for can, how can he know them? Because they are spiritually discerned. This judgment that it talks about, where it says, he who is spiritual judges all things, is talking about discernment. It's talking about how we discern. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8 says, Solid food belongs to those who by reason of use have exercised their senses to discern between good and evil. We, we need practice, ex exercise by reason of use. We've got to practice this thing. What is right, what is wrong? Do any of you listen to the news and say, yes, that's right, no, that's wrong? Hello? We've got to practice this, practice this discernment. When you listen to something, don't just switch off. Use your discernment. Practice. I've got a friend who's got an incredible healing ministry and most of his gift is just discernment. Sees incredible miracles. People delivered and set free. And he'll stand somebody up, they'll come to him and say, pray for me. And he'll say, okay, this is what has caused your illness. You had an accident when you were young and it's just a physical thing. Next person will have exactly the same problem and he says, this is a spiritual thing. You've got a devil and you need deliverance. Praise for them. Discernment, friends. It makes incredible difference when you have good discernment. And he sees incredible miracles because he can pinpoint what the issue is rather than just, you know, go and take some medicine. And who knows, when you're ill, it's great to have a miracle. It's great to get set free. But we need discernment. He who is spiritual judges all things rather than just saying, okay, Set somebody up over us to judge us. We want a king to judge us. What else does the king do? They said that our king may judge us, go out before us and fight our battles. Anybody want somebody else to fight their battles? <laughs> Jesus has won the greatest victory for us. But there are aspects that we have to fight. There are things that we have to learn how to stand our ground and fight the battles. The, the weapons of our warfare are not natural, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thought, everything that gets up in here, messes up our thinking, causes us to believe wrongly, every high thought that exalts itself, lifts up itself, that stands up against the knowledge of Christ. Every high thought. The weapons of our warfare change our mindsets. Hello? We have been given some weapons. One of the weapons that we have is the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing between the soul and the Spirit. Talk about discernment again. We have the, the sword. Jesus went into the wilderness and was tempted by the devil, and he won that victory by the Word of God, by bringing the Word and using the Word accurately to defeat the temptations. We've got to know how to use the word and use the sword of the word of God. Jesus is the word of God made flesh. We are flesh being made the word. Hello? As we partake of the word, as we are transformed, being renewed in our spirit day by day, becoming like him as we observe him and becoming Christ in the flesh. As we identify with him, Christ in me is the hope of glory and I can enter into his glory as I enter into Christ and abide in him. Are you hearing me today? We are flesh becoming the word. As we use the sword of the spirit and the word of God, what does a king do? A king goes out and battles and fights. We've got to know how to fight in the spirit. We've got to know how to use the word of God in our current situations and circumstances, not just for ourselves, but also for those around us, for those above us, for those below us, for those in authority, 
The Bible tells us to pray for those in authority. We've got to be able to... We get the government that we deserve because we're the ones that should be praying for it. Hello? So if we get a bad government, get up and pray. We'll get a good one. Get some righteous people in government. Get somebody that hears from God and learns how to discern. Hello? Come on, don't just put up and whinge. Back in, in the book of Samuel... God warned them and says, if you want a king, you'll get a king, but this is what he'll do. He'll take a tenth of everything that you've got. He'll take your sons and daughters and make them look after his household. He'll take your sons and put them in his army. He'll take your sons and make him look after his horses. He'll take of you. It won't be a nice journey. He'll put you under some bondage. That's what will happen if you get a king. They said, no, give us a king. <laughs> How am I going? <laughs> Kings make royal proclamations. Just a few times in the Old Testament, I was about four, where a king made a royal proclamation and the proclamation went throughout the whole land and everybody had to obey what the proclamation said. You've got to do what it says because the king's the boss he is the one who, who makes the laws. So we've got to do what this proclamation says. We've got to obey the proclamation. Jesus came, who is the king of kings and lord of lords, and nearly everything he said was a royal proclamation. He came and made royal proclamations, and he decreed, and he spoke, and he decreed life. He said, my words are spirit, and they are life. My words have power. They're not just naturally. You know that verse says, if it's just all natural, you can't even understand it. But he says, my words are spiritual. They have life in them. Every funeral that Jesus went to, he messed up. Even his own. <laughs> messed it up. This funeral's over because this person's come back to life. <laughs> So, but the Bible says this about us. Let me find this verse. This is a powerful one in the book of Revelations, chapter 5. It says this about us. Revelations is the last book of the Bible, right at the end. It also says it in chapter 2, but uh, they sang a new song. The four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, who is Jesus. You are worthy to take the scrolls and to open its seals, for you are slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. We are kings and priests to our God. You are kings, kings who learn how to discern rightly, kings who go out to battle, kings who make royal proclamations. You are the kings. He is the king of kings. He is the lord of lords. You are the kings and lords that he's king and lord of. Hello? He has made us priests and kings. We should be standing up and making royal proclamations royal declarations, decreeing, 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 decreeing to the spirit world, decreeing the answers of heaven. Rather than just whinging and complaining about the way the world is going, we have a role and responsibility to decree the answers of God, to be the priest who hears what God is saying. For unless you're born again, no man can see the kingdom of God. We need to see the kingdom of God, what the answer of it is, rescript what is coming and we're hearing, and declare the kingdom of God and the answer of God to our community, to our culture, to our society, to our world, to our workplace, over our situation, over our circumstances. Make royal proclamations. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We are the ones who have the authority Jesus said, I have received all authority in heaven and earth. That's natural and spiritual. He has received all authority. Therefore, you go. We are to be kings and reign on this earth. 
not just when we die. It's not pie in the sky when you die. It's steak on the plate while we wait. It's now. It's here. We're standing in authority as kings and decreeing the answer of God. Hello, are you hearing me this morning? This is my core message. It's about what we're, who we are to be. Back in the day, they said, give us a king. Somebody will do it for us. God says, no, you're the kings. You're the ones who've got to battle. You're the ones who've got to stand the ground. You're the ones who can make royal decrees, royal proclamations. You're the priests who will stand before God, a holy nation, hear from heaven, stand in the presence of God, hear the answers of God, decree the answers of God, speak them forth. It's not just prayer, which is interceding and asking God, but it's also being the voice, the mouthpiece of God, speaking the answers of God into existence. God calls those things which be not as though they were. There are some things that aren't like we want them, so it's up to us to speak them into being and have that creative authority as we speak. Hello, are you hearing me today? We can start with our own circumstances and situations and decree life to them, but we can also have a broader impact and decree and speak life into the future of our nation. I declare that we are at the beginning of a great awakening. We are at the beginning of a great awakening. It is here. It is amongst us. We've just had Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. This is a new era. It has begun. The great awakening is here. It is in our midst. I'm hearing stories here and there of people coming to Christ, people turning, people getting upset with the way they're going. This is the era of the new wine skin. Some things have been turned on the head of how we do church and stuff that's going on. But we need to be the new wineskin that can carry the glory of God that is begun, that is coming, that is here right now. I decree it in Jesus' name. Are you hearing where we're going with this? This is where we've got to stand up and decree and believe that God is here in our midst. God is here. This, this awakening today has started in our nation. I decree it. I believe it. And I declare it because it's what I see. I'm not waiting for it. I'm declaring it is here now. In Jesus' name. That's how you decree. Hello? I encourage you. Take a hold of what God wants for your life and begin to call it into being rather than waiting for God to just do it. You're his mouthpiece. You're his king. You are his flesh becoming the word. Hello? Father, I thank you today for your word, for your truth, for your life. Father, I pray that you'd help us to grab a hold of it and to walk in it and to be who you call us to be. I thank you for your mighty presence here today. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for your truth. Thank you, my God, that you're leading on this wonderful journey. I thank you, God, that we are in this great day where we'll see all that you have promised, that we will be, become all that you've called us to become, that we will see all the things that you said you're going to do. We honor you and exalt you in Jesus' marvelous name. Amen and amen and amen and amen. Thank you, musicians. Spirit of God. Spirit of God. Let's worship God. God hasn't finished here. He wants to do something with us. I'm certain of that. Thank you. And as we're worshiping, I, I sense God saying, but there are, there are people here and you just feel so insecure. You feel like, how can I be that? How can I be a king? How can I stand and make royal decree? I'm not worthy. I'm nobody. I'm no good. I hear all this self-talk coming from your, your inner life. And, and this stuff is stopping you from entering in. This, this, this thing that keeps coming up and speaks to you and, and your circumstances, your past, what people have spoken over you, you know, the, the, the hurts, the stuff that goes on the inside. It's a, it, God wants to break that this morning. I see God wants to come and just bring an anointing and a, a touch of His presence to stop the restrictions that are binding you. Thank you, Spirit of God. I'd love to pray with you and believe with you. Some of you are saying, no, I can't respond to that. I'm too insecure. But I'd love to pray with you if you'd come. I break that thing in Jesus' name. I break that bondage in the name of Jesus. I decree you are a king. You are holy. You are a royal priesthood. You are a chosen generation. You are. I break those words, those lies that are in your inner life. I 
break that insecurity. I break that thing that's speaking to you. We break its power in the name of Jesus. We break that thing at its root. And we decree the answer of God. We decree the presence of God. We decree the truth of who God says you are. You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are an overcomer. You are a victor. You are holy. You are righteous. You are created according to God in righteousness and true holiness. You are created in His image. You are. You are. You are. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Spirit of God. Thank you, Spirit of God. I decree it. I decree it. I decree it. This is what God is saying right now. You are not too old. You are not too old. Moses started his real core of his ministry when he was 80. You are not too old. You are not past the days when God can do what he wants to do through you. You are not in the name of Jesus. I break that lie. I release his future, his purpose, and the anointing of his life to you in Jesus' name. You are not too old. Thank you, Spirit of God. Thank you, Spirit of God. Neither are you too young. You are not too poor. You're not too wealthy. You're not too rich. You're not too weak. God, you are a chosen generation. You are chosen. You are a chosen generation. This is the chosen generation. This is the day of the Lord. This is it. Thank you, Spirit of God. Come on, receive it.